Uh, hi, I'm John Troy. I worked with Sean Lord a long time ago on EverQuest. I started working there in oh 2002. It's right out of college and uh, got a job working on the game that I've been playing for the past three years or whatever it was at the time. Um, see, I played a whole lot of video games growing up. I think I played my first one I played ever. No, I played, uh, what was that? Wizardry. 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 The Proving Grounds of the Mad Overlord. Hell yeah, it was fantastic. So I got into RPGs really early on. And then uh, I had a roommate in college show me EverQuest. I didn't, I didn't play a lot of PC games. I was, a, I was a big console gamer and hadn't heard about it or anything. And then roommate said, check this game out. And uh, you know, I, I went and got a copy as soon as I could and then played it you know, in college. Not a lot, probably more than I should have. Yeah. I think a lot of people have that experience. Yeah. But uh, then I, uh, I was able to get a job working on it, which was pretty exciting at the time. I, uh, stayed, I've stayed in the game industry. I'm, a, I'm at a startup or a company right now work, working for uh, Protagonist Games. So still, still like making games, still enjoying it. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, your your job titles changed a good bit, though. Like when you came in, well, you are always you are always. Um, it, it, my memory of you has always been that dude that came in that was a part of Rich's guild. Uh, Rich and Roy, I guess, were were both in your guild, um, and you you had a CS degree, and I think you know that was one of those things that was immediately like the combination of CS degree, and I, I think the. Um, focus on like theory craft and, and, uh, essentially I think rich pitched you as like, there's this guy that really, really knows the game, um, knows, you know, knows a high end game, a guild mate of mine, who's also mm -hmm. very technical. And at that time, and this is an area I definitely want to dig into a good bit. Um, at that time, systems and, and where we were at with regards to like systems headroom and all the other challenges we were facing were, were a big topic. Um, and so I just, I've always known you as being, uh, someone that was like very technical, but so I wasn't shocked when I saw the evolution of your, your titles on LinkedIn. Um, yeah. but I, I also remember like when we worked together on planes of power and your, your writing quests and shit, I was like, Oh wow! All right. So, not only is John technical, but he he's a hell of a good writer, right? Like this is a very emotional quest. I, I we'll have to dig into it. Like I forget exactly what it was, but I could have sworn it was like a dwarf or something that really made me just kind of go like, it blew my mind. Anyway, yeah, I remember that. Um, as we're getting started, you said you could hear yourself on a stream, right? I could. I had to mute the stream because what I was hearing was an echo of myself Perfect. talking like three seconds later. But yeah. That, well, that at least confirms that you were, um, you're coming through and they can hear you. If anybody is in chat at the moment, can you confirm whether or not sound's working and the sound levels are good? Sounds working. Yeah, sounds good. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, way to, way to come in and not say hello at all the entire time, everybody. I, I wasn't even sure if anybody was there. All right. Perfect, John. Um, nice. Cool. Yeah, this is a, this is going to be a fun one because we're just kind of sneaking you in and people are going to be bummed that they missed you. So huh. cool. Now that I'm less distracted by whether or not um, they can hear you, I can focus more. Um, I moved the camera around, too, so I'm in a weird position. I feel like I'm looking away from you the whole time. I've got to fix this shit anyway. Uh, OK, yeah, <laughs> I see. the. Do you see buttons on my screen? I see like the little bottom of the little... button. Yeah, let me. Is that right? Oh, OK, yeah, yeah, let me fix right. that. We're running a very uh, sophisticated operation here. <laughs> cool, man. All right, so John, um, why did you, like your roommate recommended EverQuest in college and kicked it off? Like, but were you looking for something online at the time, or was it like no? Not at all. I like I said, I I played mostly console games and really mostly RPGs. I was I don't know, let's see, this is freshman year of college. For me, I think so. I was playing probably Final Fantasy, some Final Fantasy games on the PlayStation mm. is my guess. I don't remember the exact sequence there, but 
that's mostly what I played. I played single player games. I played offline games. I didn't, uh, I didn't do a whole lot of PC gaming at all. So he showed it to me and I was like, oh, it's an RPG. Oh, that's cool. He's like, oh no, it's online. You can play with all these other people. They're all, it's real. Mm-hmm. So I was, uh, I was kind of blown away by that. Yeah. I hadn't gotten into MUDs or anything, you know, the precursors. I'd never seen any of it. it just wasn't my, it wasn't the scene I was into. Uh, so I, I got it. I, I do recall I played it, you know, at, uh, at school there, which was fine because I had a good connection and a decent computer. And then I went home for the summer and uh, was on, you know, dial up with AOL. Mm. And uh, my dad's computer, which I, I think the video card was actually under spec. It couldn't, it couldn't really play. So I had, a, I had a rough experience in the beginning. But it's obviously good enough for me to push through and keep doing it. Yeah, I mean, and you played, I mean, you played pretty high end. Did you just happen to run into like Rich and Roy on those guys when, because you, you were in, uh, well, am I allowed to say your guild and stuff? I think Rich has already spilled the beans, but. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, this is 15 years ago. Yeah, yeah. 20, 20 years ago. I don't, I don't, yeah. I don't have any problems with it. You were in Keepers of the Faith with those guys. How did you, how did you wind up in there? And I assume you just, you met them through that or? Yeah, I met them through there. I was. Friends with a another monk and a, a druid that that just kind of met randomly, played with them occasionally here and there. And uh, as I got a higher level, um, at some point they they told me, "Hey, we just joined this guild. You want to check it out?" And I hadn't joined any guilds before that. I just kind of had my friends and played a lot of solo and and whatever. And uh, so I said, "Sure, that sounds good." I didn't do any kind of try out or interview or anything i just got into the guild and then found myself in one of the the top guilds on the server for kind of i, I didn't really know what i was doing there <laughs> <laughs> but um i i ended up playing a lot more i think because of it i i just it just ended up being oh we're doing raids we're doing all these things that take up a lot of time so i probably played the game a lot more than i would have if i if i hadn't ended up doing that how much were you playing like when you say a lot more what was a uh... What was a work week of playing like? Man, it it feels like you know uh, a lot of a lot of the hours that I wasn't actually in school or or studying. I did I did keep my studies up. I still went out with friends in college and all, but they definitely were on. You know, my friends, my real life friends, were on me about how much I was playing this game and. <laughs> Am I gonna come back and you know, come out with them? So they gave me a hard time about it. Um, so I ended up doing that, and I, you know, it was a weird, weird balance of like, oh, I want to do this raid, but also my friends are going to a party, so I probably should go with them. And yeah, I don't know. We're 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 trying to balance that, I guess, in college. But I, I felt that actually when I moved to California, because uh, you know, one of, one of my closest friends at the time had moved from Alabama to California to work in the skateboard industry there. And he was kind of my backup plan if I couldn't get into Varent. And so <laughs> like he was there and like all these, all these people um, that I knew from the skate park had moved out to work with him and all that stuff. And they were always like, Hey, you want to go do blah, blah. I'm like, no, I got it. And I had to try to explain to him why I was spending like 11 or 14 hours on, on a weekend playing this game that I, you know, I just gotten a customer service on. It's, it's, it was hard to explain back then. That was a hard sell, right? I mean, nobody ever. It, nowadays, there's more jokes, and you know, people who are obsessed with video games and you know play play WoW constantly, whatever it is. But mm. back then, it was I feel like a very a new thing. It was just you were some weirdo for for <laughs> actually playing a video game this much. It was just insane. Which I mean, maybe it was, but <laughs> yeah, well, at least it was good kind yeah. of. So. Yeah. How did, I mean, at that, at that point, um, you're wrapping up school, I guess you're playing this game a lot and it sounded like you knew Rich at least in the guild and maybe what he was doing or. Uh, yeah, I, I met Rich. I, I met him cause I, I got an argument with him actually. Um, oh, me too. He was in the guild. Yeah. He was in the guild and there was some debate in the guild about, somebody who had had sold some things on eBay before but 
we were going to let him in. We were asking, we were talking about whether we were going to let him in the guild or someone who had, in the guild who had sold stuff that he'd gotten on eBay. And there's this huge debate about whether we're going we're gonna to allow this behavior in our guild. Yeah. And I remember Rich piping up about it. Um, and I didn't know who he was at the time. I hadn't played with him really. He's just, you know, another random guild mate. And I, you know, sent him a tell after this. I was just, you know, the debate in the guild kind of dies down. And I was, I was carrying it on with him off, off the, uh, off in tells. That's the first time I remember actually talking to him, you know? Um, and then, but I guess it, you know, worked out. Okay. We ended up becoming friends in spite of that, in spite of our disagreement. I don't actually remember who was on which side. But <laughs> it was a big funny. topic back in the day. I don't know if you remember, like yeah. people selling things on eBay was, you know, I don't know. It was a big thing. It was a misuse of the guild, right? Especially if it wasn't like sanctioned by the, the guild. Yeah, I, I could see where in yeah. my guild something like that might have flown, but my guild leader would have been like, we're going to sell this in order to get the money to buy these two clerics new video cards or something. Um, yeah. So Yeah, I think, yeah. People selling accounts and all too back then. Yeah. That was a big, it was a big thing. It was a no-no. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's black ball status. Yeah, so, all right. Then did Rich just kind of come to you and go, hey, by the way, do you want to come out and join the company that you're playing this game a shitload of? <laughs> he, uh, he told me that he'd gotten the job out there. He, uh, I had talked to him about, you know, hey, I'm, I'm you know, studying computer science. I want to get into the game industry when I get out. And he told me that he was in the game industry. So we chatted a lot about that. And I don't remember where he was before uh, Varent 3DO, maybe? It's been a while. Oh. Uh... Yeah, well, no, was 3DO or Crystal? Was he at Crystal Dynamics after? Or maybe. Yeah, after, Crystal Dynamics okay. after. That's a, that, didn't, that wasn't around back then, I don't think. But anyway, he told me he got a job working for Varen, and, you know, of course, I'm pressing him for details, but he was, uh, you know, he's like, I can't tell you everything about it, but, you know, I can talk to you about some of this. <laughs> but he told me, you know, uh, that he'd be willing to give me a, a shot at, at, a, at an interview if I mm -hmm. wanted to for a game design position. And, uh, you know, I was studying computer science in school. I was learning how to program. And, but, you know, it's the opportunity to go and work on the game that I love, that I'm playing so much. So I said, sure, you know, that sounds good. I can, I can do some game design. That sounds fun. And that's what I interviewed as. And that's what I started as. That's, you know, we were on the game design team together. Yeah. Um, but I was coming into it with a background of, you know, I've, I've been studying programming for the past four years. So I remember as soon as I got there, once, you know, I got on the team, I went to the, I went to uh, Scott Hartsman, who was the lead programmer for it, and uh, asked him if I could have access to the, you know, the source code and everything so I could look at, look at how things work. I was going to ask you about this, actually, because I have, a, I, so my memory, this is how I've been telling the story for the last 15 years or so, at least. Um, <laughs> So let me know if it's wrong. I've been trying to confirm some of these. Yeah. I remember there was like a specific thing that you wanted to see the source code on um, because there was an argument about whether or not something worked the way that it supposedly worked. And m so my story I've created about you is that you knew that this thing was not working properly. And in getting the source code, like when you finally got access to it, you proved that you were correct on that topic, which then people trusted you more on that, having the code. Did, did I make all that up? I don't, uh, I don't remember a specific one just like that. I do remember I, I got access to the source code just because, you know, I was, I was like, I'm a programmer. I'd like to see what's going on. Um, but then I ended up looking things up a lot because, um, I don't know if you remember back then, there weren't a lot of resources mm -hmm. for figuring out how some of the things worked. Yeah. There was a, a document that we had. It was like a Word doc or something that said, you know, if you put two in the flying kick field, it means that the enemy is going to run away. If the, yeah, like all those really yeah. weird yeah, yeah. <laughs> things, right? We had that. But when I wanted to know, like, is this weapon going to do more damage than this weapon? There weren't any tools like on the dev side for that. This is something players have been trying to figure out. Like, 
you know, how do, how do the formulas work? How does the game work? How do all the, all the, the details of spells work and anything like that? And, you know, I expected when I, when I started the company, they would have all these things that told me how it, how it actually worked. <laughs> <but> it didn't. <laughs> yeah. So that was one of, I mean, one of the first things, not first things, but one of the early things I did was, was, you know, crawl through the code and make some Excel spreadsheets and, uh, and tools, I think in, in visual basic to, uh, to try to figure out how the things were actually functioning. So I yeah. could design. <laughs> Yeah, no, I remember. And and that was huge. It was so one of the things that's um the the way that I always remember that period was um when you came in, we were dealing with a lot of potential challenges to the lo- longevity of the game. Like I remember that being a a big thing, right? Like we were we were running into weird headroom issues. There are formulas that were not going to work much longer if they were kind of even working at that point. And then, you know, and then, then there were the other things like, um, oh shit, we're running out of space in the item database, uh, all that sort of stuff. So I remember all of that kind of being around that, like, cause that was like planes of power, right? You came in during then? I came in just before, like, so I was, yeah. I was there for the development of planes of power early on. Um, what I, one of the first things I did on there was, um, I think fixing up some things for Luckland because as your my recollection of, of the game is, you know, everybody was very excited and, and had a great time with um Coon Arc and Velius. And then Luckland came out and reaction was a little more mixed with uh in terms of what things were working and not there. I mm-hmm. just I don't remember all the all the details about what the problems were. And maybe that was just from the high end guild perspective, but I recall there being a lot of problems, especially with uh what was it? Vexthal, the, the yeah. end dungeon in Velius, or in, uh, uh, luck, in luck, like, it was just, yeah. it was just like, you know, people we'll say this isn't fun. This is just a slog. We're just, you know, hit this boss for 10 minutes until he dies and that's it. So there were some scaling issues, I think. And, uh, as I later learned, once I joined, just people not quite knowing how, how some of the things worked, um, in terms of, in terms of the formulas for how, how things, how hard things hit and how, aggro worked and what this means for what the boss will and how hard this boss is going to be it was very ad hoc it was very let's just throw this on there and see what happens and it made it hard to tune things yeah um and that was very much the case uh, because uh, the the thing was like you said there wasn't really documentation the people that might have known that stuff had pretty much all left like right mm-hmm. at that expansion um right after Luckland, and then the those of us that were still there were like well, i don't know you know I, I basically have gotten a i've learned how to as an apprentice use the database but hell if i know you know the underlying formulas and i'd be curious if even before people left if they fully understood the underlying formulas to be honest um one, one sec we had two questions john that might help um did you what was your gm name do you remember uh kavok kavok that's right a-V-H-O-K. Yep. And then, um, and when were you on the team? Because your LinkedIn shows you at 2004, but that's when you were a senior designer. You came in 2001 mm. or? It was 2002. Basically, I graduated. I, I had all the credits I needed from college and I had this job opportunity. So I chose to graduate early and, uh, and move up. So it was, it was early 2002, probably a little bit before the school year would have ended. Right on. And then I worked on EverQuest up through. That's a good question. Let's see. All right, you might have to help me out with this. We did we did Planes of Power. And then they told us right away we have to do the other little one, like Legacy. Legacy yeah. Legacy something, right? Legacy of Akesha? Yep. It was just like the little kind of tiny dungeons and the and the uh there's all the quality of life things, right? Yeah. There's like bank slots and die and cartography and that's where we added is that where we added the 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 extra slot to your character and it, it was a charm or something like that? Oh, I don't remember. That that sounds like something we would have lobbed in there. It was like any yeah. little any programming thing that we could plop in there. 
And then Eldon was after that. Um, and so Eldon was when we did yeah. the thing with, uh, where we did the instancing, we did the wayfarers with like the, the point system and all sorts That's of other right. stuff. But we had already like the stuff that I find like the, the crazy stuff I remember being fixed and worked on was prior to that. It seemed like, it seemed like there was a lot of stuff going on under the hood for planes of power. Yeah, I think we were doing a lot there. I, that's, that's where I ended up. So I guess backing up the first thing I, one of the first things I ended up doing was re-itemizing the, the end dungeon in, uh, Lucklin mm -hmm. because people got in there and the, the, the high end loot for, for the guilds that were raiding it was, was underwhelming. And so that was one of the first things I did. I went and, and, uh, fixed up a lot of the loot there to make it uh, more valuable. And then that's kind of where I ended up becoming the, the, the person who did a lot of the itemization for planes yeah. of power. Um, which, you know, I can, I can look back on and, and recall that there were problems with that, but, um, it was just, it was kind of a, my first, my first big task. And that was, that was where I was going with, in terms of my, uh, I don't know, my focus on the, on the design team, right? A lot of the yeah. itemization, tuning of, of NPCs and, and balance and that kind of stuff. No, um, you, 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 I remember you being really a critical component of that. And that's not to, that's not to shortchange any other contribution that was going on at the time. Um, I think when we look back on those expansions, a lot of the people that come into the stream really enjoyed that period. Um, we, you know, we did some stuff that's maybe more controversial, you know, for different yeah. people with instancing later on, et cetera, or the plane of knowledge, but we discussed that here ad nauseum. Um, uh, so we don't have to get into it again, but, um, the, but generally speaking, like I, I look back on it, I'm like, I don't know how we would have pulled that off if you hadn't come in and sort of grabbed itemization and really structured it for the first time since I, I'd been there, right? It was very ad hoc and kind of bullshitty before that. Yeah. And we saw that, like, as a player, I recognized that. You know, I remember uh, in Kunark, you'd, you know, people were all descending on Seblis because all this great loot was there and nobody wanted to go to Cardock or whatever that, Chardock? Yeah. Chardock. Because same, you know, pr pretty close to the same difficulty in terms of all the NPCs and the loot was terrible. And it was because they had completely different designers who made all the loot for the dungeon and didn't talk to each other about it, right? So one guy made his loot really cool and the other guy didn't. Yep. And it was just a weird, weird inconsistent uh, experience, as I recall. Um, well, well, I mean, but... Lucklin, the one story that's been told here a couple of times by different folks was the night of the itemization fiasco in Lucklin, where it was super late and everybody was like told, all right, starting at 11 PM, we're having a meeting, bring in all the items for your zones. <laughs> and it was like eight or, you know, different designers or were coming in and some people were good with items and some people were good with like, um, fiction and some people were good with trade skills. And it was just a, such a random ass mix of items that just turned into like a shouting match where people were like, you can't do that, you know? So yeah, it was, it was pretty ad hoc before right. you were and there. That's, I think that the design was usually like, you get this dungeon, you mm -hmm. get this dungeon, right? It was, and so you were expected, even if you're great at lore, maybe you're great at designing encounters, you're not good at items, doesn't matter, that's your dungeon, go itemize it. Yeah. Like that was kind of the philosophy where uh, people just had to do it all and I don't, I mean, I just don't think that always worked very well for, for the early game. Um, so getting back to that point, I guess I was, I was working there on, uh, so we did Eldon after Legacy of Kesha. We did Gates of Discord. Is that next? Um, so Legacy of Kesha, Eldon, was it Gates and then Omens? Gates had, a, you know, and Gates had its own set of problems. Yes. Um, that I was on there for omens. I was starting to transition off, I believe, or at least I was doing. I think some more more of the lead role on omens and less of the the day to day stuff. I had handed off itemization to another designer back then, and then 
either during Omens or shortly off, I, uh, I, I went off to another project. I went to a, a PlayStation three game, as I recall. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, we, we talk about gate or yeah, gates a good bit here because gates was the expansion that rich, rich Hartsman and I were yanked over the course of like 24 hours to go work on EQ two. And, and then yeah. it kind of got a bit chaotic on the team. Yeah. And, uh, I think uh, the, the the power void or the the leadership void really that that happened with Gates ended up causing some problems with that. Yeah, yeah, I see that. I see the 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 question on the stream. Yeah, the, the basically they they yanked Rich, the lead designer, and uh, Sean, who was really kind of second in command at that time, as well as the lead programmer, and threw them all off onto another onto EQ two. And we were all sort of scrambling to put things back and get things kind of under control. So I, uh, I think some things, some things fell, uh, fell under the radar there. The, one of the big problems on Gates that I had to deal with, as I recall, were that um, uh, people were messing around a lot with the, the settings in the NPCs and didn't really know what they meant. Mm. And so everything was, every, you know, people were saying, oh, this, you know, everything's hitting too hard and it's destroying us and this isn't fun. This is, you know, the, the difficulty didn't scale very well. So I had done a lot of work before that trying to figure out how players work, how player weapons work, how their spells work, what the resistance are. I hadn't dug as much into the NPC balance um, side of things for just like, you know, the trash mobs, the regular stuff that you'd fight. And yeah. I ended up having to write a bunch of scripts afterwards that would go through and kind of evaluate the difficulty of NPCs and how hard they were. And um, it showed, you know, I, could, I could run the script on, you know, here's, here's what things look like in Planes of Power. Here's what they look like in Velius. And here looks like, here's Gates. And, you know, the difficulty just scaled way out of, out of proportion with what it was supposed to be. And so... Uh, we were able to make, go make some changes based on that. But I was, like I said, partly in a leadership role. And I was, that was kind of my first time doing that. Um, Which and I remember being a little over my head and in, involved in that. I remember th there was a, there was a while where before that period, cause I was gone for gates. I came back for omens. A lot of what I did on omens, honestly, was just try to reduce scope and like okay. get that thing done. Um, and, you know, sort of, worked with the team and i remember we we redesigned it to be i think uh something that was more easily not only achievable from an implementation standpoint from action but qa could actually have time to qa it so yeah um and then but i remember before that the um you you're talking about like power scaling and, and things of that nature in planes the work that you're doing um to basically go in and work with like the programmers and some other folks I, I thought it was you that was doing it to redesign some of our like combat formulas like a lot of the behind the scenes got changed i thought i don't i don't recall a lot of it getting changed we did do some tweaks here and there um to some of the formulas but let's see that was during planes. We we added some new uh, stats. That was where um, we were trying to because the the way that the stats worked and they capped mm -hmm. at what was it? I don't know, two fifty five, three hundred five back then maybe. Um, I remember looking through the formulas and saying, "Oh, look, you know, people say don't go for Dex, go for AC because it's a whole lot. You know, Dex doesn't do much." I'm looking at the formulas. So I'm like, "Oh yeah, it's not programmed to do very much here." Right, and Looking back, I think it would have been, you know, a cleaner approach to try to reformulate the things to actually do some, have more effect, have more value in the game and scale in a reasonable manner, um, you know, with, with a sliding scale where it's like, oh, like you need to, the higher level you are, the, the more that you need to get that kind of stuff. But uh, the scope of that at that time was, was kind of big. It was like, oh, we have to redo this and redo all the existing balance back in the game mm -hmm. 
um, it would just be crazy. It, you know, we were like, when are we going to have the time to do that while we're trying to make an expansion at the same time? So we ended up going <laughs> the direction of like, okay, let's add some new piece, new stats that are actually doing something. And uh, we introduced a lot of those into uh, into the plane of time originally. And this was just basically stats that could affect things that previously you couldn't change at all, like how much uh, damage you could mitigate off of NPCs, like how much base damage you can mitigate and all this kind of stuff. Certain ways that spells could scale. Um, we got a little bit of that with focus effects, but there weren't as many effects on items that could scale your spells. We started at trying to add more pieces to the itemization system so that we could give players stats that were more important and that could, uh, could scale better. So there was a lot of that going on behind the scenes. There was um, uh, the infamous monk nerf that, uh, that happened during that time. Um, another, looking back, poor decision on, on the, I think, the part of the team. Um, Definitely elaborate but, on that if you, if you can, because I'm sure people are going to want to know. Yeah, that was, that was the, the complaint about monks previously to, or previous to Planes of Power was that they were overpowered, they were, could tank, at least on the high end, right? This is, this is where a lot of this comes in. The high end, they could tank nearly as well as warriors because of the way that a lot of the stuff were scaled in Planes of Power. This is the AC nerf. <laughs> um, so there's basically all these hidden weird formulas behind the scenes that that changed the way that that armor class affected different characters so it wasn't visible it didn't sh it like we had the number that you shot that you saw on the screen wasn't the actual number that the game was using internally it was it was not connected in a lot of ways it was uh i thought very poorly done um but the the approach before this is in, in uh, let's see, right before Planes of Power came out, was, okay, well, we'll tune down the monks a little bit on that and so that they are taking more damage more randomly to try to balance them against warriors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, which was a poorer choice. It was later completely undone. More damage more randomly sounds fun. Yeah, the way that, like I said, the 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 whole way the formulas worked and how the how the player how the the balance of the NPCs against the players was, this wasn't documented anywhere. It was <laughs> written down. There were just a bunch of numbers in the code with no comments, no explanation. It was just here's here's a here's a random you know uh, function that gets called. And if you're a monk, call this thing. And if you're a warrior, call this thing. And if it was just a lot of spaghetti code is what they call it. It's you're trying to trace this down and figure out what's going on. And there's just not a lot of explanation for it. So um, we attempted to balance monks a little bit better by tuning down one of these numbers. And the effect it had was, uh, I think, that the um basically monks going up from level one to to 35 or so if you looked at the way that the numbers uh actually functioned and the the the, the armor that they could get they were really great they were they could tank really well they could dodge really well they could they basically you know survive really well and then the the numbers we tuned down were like oh well, this this makes it a little more even than we compared, you know, how how they compared to, to warriors with the equivalent gear that they could get at their level, and we said, okay, this seems like a, a better approach. Mm -hmm. But the end result was that they uh, they couldn't survive because uh, they, like I said, they took the damage a lot more randomly. Yeah, and of course, back then, nobody you couldn't heal very fast at, as a you know if you're trying to solo or anything like that, you are just sitting down to, you can bandage up to a certain point, you can mend if you're a monk. But the, the downtime was really terrible for all melee classes, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the approach that we took for, let's just try to fix monks by themselves and, and ignore the, all the problems that melee characters are having relative to casters in terms of longevity, in terms of being able to solo and that kind of stuff. It was a very, 
targeted approach and it was the wrong one because we should have said hey let's look at the characters overall and say hey uh let's try to fix the way that they work right. in a more global way and then we can try to do some balance on top of this but doing a really like laser focused let's nerf this one class you know not what i would do nowadays yeah well in all fairness though that 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 was during a period where there are a number of problems that were existing problems that we were looking at on top of the fact that we had an extremely junior team that was uh, trying to make their first EverQuest expansion as a team with a new producer who, uh, <laughs> as, as Fisher would say, is like, this, this game is dumb. Um, you people go figure it out. <laughs> great, great, great guy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it yeah. was, it, it's a shock that we didn't burn the building down. Um, so it's okay. You, you're allowed a, a nerf or two. Though I am sitting here as a monk right now, and I, you know, I'm moving every once in a while. I'm not ignoring I'm moving so I don't get AFK'd out. But I'm a monk in your honor because you played a monk and you caught a whole bunch of shit for hating monks, apparently, uh, despite the fact that you, Rich, well, at least you and Rich both played monks at the time that you were ripping them. I did. I had a, I had a extremely high level, highly well equipped monk at the time, but, um, that's not what I was basing stuff on. <laughs> Good question. Um, uh, how would a guy like that get in charge with the question? That's a funny one. We can tackle that one separately. Oh yeah. End of the day, though, uh, he he's caught a he's caught a bunch of shit, but honestly, he's still one of my favorite managers in terms of learning about management and project management and everything else. But uh, it was just Sony back in the day. How did a guy like that get in charge? Well, I mean, how did you have an entire team of basically people that were in customer service a year before making? the expansion for your number one revenue generator in the company. <laughs> it was, I remember, I mean, this is a weird, this is a weird thing we had at the time where they said, you know, they, the idea was that EverQuest 2 would come out and I don't know, it would somehow just pull all the players away from EverQuest and be better or it would pull new people in. I remember thinking it was a really weird approach as a player at the time. I was, you know, I'm a designer on the game. I'm working on EverQuest, but then they're saying, "Hey, we're, we're working on EverQuest 2. I remember just thinking, you know, well, we've got a bunch of all, people playing this game online. It's like a service, so aren't you just gonna like split your player base? Like some people are gonna stay here, some people are gonna go there, and that's exactly what happened, right? The the numbers, uh, the total number of players playing our games didn't go up a whole lot. It just kind of shifted from EverQuest to EverQuest 2. And then WoW came out and, yeah. and obliterated all those numbers. So Yeah, it definitely helped. Uh, or it didn't help. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I remember thinking it was, a, it, was an odd, it was an odd approach at the time. Yeah. But that said, during that period, it, it felt like we, maybe because of that, maybe because there was that thought that, oh, the, you know, the next thing's going to come out and it's going to sort of fix various problems and absorb all the people we got a lot of leeway to kind of try and we also got left alone a good bit to to do a lot of stuff i mean we basically just had to put a box on the shelf every x number of months right it was just it was sort of like well everquest is dependent on making money just tell them to do whatever the, all the focus all the resources in the company were in everquest too as i recall not yeah. all but you know significant the, the lion's share of it yeah yeah um so you you not only did like all the sort of base itemization and over time i remember you like trained up some other people maybe camille some uh, i could have sworn you, you trained others to do that but you also did some content implementation i remember in planes uh plane of justice yep i had two i got the plane of justice and the plane of war mm -hmm. And then the plane of war the, didn't work out. The art, um, we had problems with the art. It was like the, the place was too big. We were trying to populate it. And I, I threw like 600 NPCs in there and it was, still looked sparse and it was, couldn't function. And so we ended up scrapping it. Yeah. Um, so I did plane of justice. It was my first zone. And um, 
<laughs> I recall. Um, had had uh, some growing pains with trying to figure that out myself. And yeah. then I, I just got the one zone because I was going to do itemization. So I think other people got two zones overall. Um. <laughs> yeah, you just got a compliment in chat. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Iki. I don't know who Zarn is. Who's Zarn? Um, I was going to say that's so we got so scripting. So, so that was one of the, the surprises when I first joined the team, right? Was how do all the things work behind the hood or under the hood behind the scenes? Um, you know, how does, how does this, this, how do you make a quest and have these cool things happen and why do they break so much? And mm -hmm. I'm sure you remember the same thing, right? Because it was all invisible NPCs shouting messages at it, one another. Yeah, I loved zone. it. Right. I loved it. Just duct tape um, all to hell. I loved it. It was, it was, it was very, uh, like no, nobody would, nobody would ever do that on purpose nowadays, but I would, um, <laughs> <laughs> as, as we're working our little indie game, I'm like, can we just have invisible shouts? <laughs> oh yeah. The, uh, so you know, the, then uh, Jeff Peterson came in and he said, Hey, I can write you guys a real, a script system. So you can write, you know, write things that are a little more dependable and that are a little more powerful. And so as I recall, planes of power was the first time we had to exercise that it was, um, being put into the game towards, you know, during the, the production of, of, uh, planes of power, maybe it was just before in Luckland or like after Luckland had shipped. I think after looking at a ship. Yeah. So Luckland wasn't using any of that. There was still all the, the, you know, invisible NPCs that, you know, this is what, this would, this is what would cause things like, uh, you know, the Coldane ring quest back in Velius to break. It would just like things are going along and then it didn't happen because it was really hard to, to tune and to debug a system that was based on um, something you couldn't, you couldn't really test very well. So we got the we got the scripting system for plays of power and i remember i used that somebody mentioned for the the uh the trials in planes of justice that was that was my first my first use of it and then uh there was a a sort of a half half scripted and half invisible shout system going on in plane of time mm -hmm. and that is what that we were, it was also, you know, sh you know, it's shipped and that zone was just not tested. It, it didn't get full, you know, beta tested. And that's where we get, you know, Fires of Heaven went in there and we get the, hey, you have 14 days to fix your shit message from Fuhrer, if you recall. Yeah, no, I recall. It, it's been brought up in here. So it's a... I was the person who had to go in there and rewrite the entire script for the plane's time to make it not completely broken and then i believe ryan barker was the one who went in and tried to fix the bosses to actually be good so that was that was exciting but that was that was scripting we got to do that in planes of power <laughs> did you fix it within 14 days <laughs> it was really annoying because it's just you remember this i mean i, I, I absolutely yes, had to get fixed but the whole like the whole feel of oh well you know our 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 resources and our game development are being dictated by you know posts by people you know the high-end guilds on message boards wasn't a good look either but we're like well yeah it does need to get fixed though so yeah, it's just terrible uh, <sighs> people yeah people go ahead oh i was just i'm i'm looking at chat here uh, uh, todd was mentioning that nash Mash helped too. Mash did he Mash did some of the original scripting um of the scripted part and not the not the invisible shot part of Plane of Time. And uh it wasn't uh wasn't all working quite right. So we had to work together to to get it to get it fixed in the end. Uh Plane of Earth fight that everybody hated was Eugene. Yeah. Well we had this conversation. Like a couple of days ago, because someone was like, uh, 
so they mentioned you know, they'll mention that they hated that but then they also talked about how much they loved plain of water i think and also plain of disease and i think eugene did all of them so he came out ahead at the end of the conversation he did plain of fire too eugene did uh, plain of fire i think didn't he uh he i wouldn't be shocked i wouldn't be shocked I don't know yeah. if he did all of them by himself, but he was very much like come in, put his headphones on, and next thing you know, you have one of the craziest raid zones. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he was really focused, I remember. Yeah. <laughs> are, are you scanning chat now? <laughs> I am. I was, just, I was just looking. I was about to say, because... We, uh, if you're going to be here for an hour, we got about 15 minutes left. Uh, 45 minutes have flown by. Um, so yeah, if you want to snatch stuff out of chat, that works as well. Um, yeah, Plain Earth. The Plain Earth uh, boss fight, I remember just being br like a slog. Right, you had to, you had to tank. You had to like have people tanking each of these things while you're focused on one and then move to the next one. It was a 45 minute fight or something like that back in the day. And it wasn't, it wasn't like, Oh, this is so hard. We can't get through it. It was just brutal. Mm -hmm. Just slog it out. So, um, nobody, nobody particularly enjoyed the fight. It's yeah. It's just like the, the, the end ray, like I said, of, uh, of Luckland, the whole, the, the final boss of that, it wasn't a hard fight. Nobody, once you got there, nobody lost. It was just long, long, long fight, and it was really boring. And you had to, you know, all the clerics are having to keep up their heel chain if, you, if people are doing the heel chain back then. And nobody really enjoyed it. So, like you were saying, like everybody kind of doing their own, doing their own zone, and whether they're good about good at particular fights or not was was not known. Yeah, well, and it was interesting because that was also a period where we made so much content. And looking back, a pretty short amount of time. And so it, we had those checks of like, when we did the initial zone reviews, it would be like, everybody bring in like your one pager. And I remember Eugene would come in with like a 20 pager each time. And we're like, <laughs> you're going to have to rein it in a little bit in order to get it done. And yet, even when we reduced it, he was able to sit down and just be like, if I have time... Why can't I just keep adding more? And so I, I remember those those last four. And then our I think our rationale was, well, they are like the four elemental planes. Like the, you know, these are the big ones. So have at it. And some yeah. of it worked out really well and some of it needed some adjustment. I'm still I think he did a great job on it. Yeah. No, I think I and I think a lot of those were were well liked. I, like people were saying, I think the the planes in general, the higher end ones were were pretty well done um and then of course i mean the plane of time was its own was its own thing like i said we were trying to experiment with sort of pseudo instancing back then right that there was mm -hmm. no support in the code and so we were like oh well they gave us a scripting system let's try to make this work so uh the high-end guilds aren't fighting over the npcs and they can actually share them in some kind of way but yeah it was it was really messed up in the uh they're trying to do that in a in a half you know in a scripting system but just really it wasn't meant to to do anything that uh dynamic so we were just kind of pushing the you know pushing the limits of what we were able to do which i mean that's what people were doing with the invisible shouts right all those people coming in before us and and what some of the stuff you guys did as, as apprentices we were just like all right well how can we make this this quest as cool as we possibly can using these weird limited set of tools that we have yeah and i think that's what we always ended up doing as designers on that game absolutely and some of my honestly some of my favorite time in the industry now that i can kind of reflect back was hacking shit together during that period and making some weird stuff work that shouldn't have yeah um zarn Asked again, John, do you recall your role on in Dragons of Norath? From what I can tell, um, you went and made the entire expansion progression A work based on some real snazzy scripting. So Zarn's on the team. Are you, are you still on the team? You're on the team, right, Chris? Um, but I don't know if you guys overlapped. 
Chris. Chris who? Chris Black. Did I get that right, Sarn? I don't think we were overlapped. I don't. I don't recall. Um, Dragons North, man. <laughs> I uh, I don't really remember completely. I do remember switching all the AAs over to, or helping helping uh, Alan Krause switch over all the AAs to to use uh, data so that we could actually make them and tune them as designers. I don't know if you remember this part. Like they were all hard coded into the into the the code for the game. Like the way that your AAs worked, and uh, wasn't it, a great way to, to develop things. It, it makes sense. Uh, well, it, it makes sense that that would have been the way that it happened, um, yeah. and then got changed. Uh, I don't think I really did anything directly on it um, with AAs. Yeah. That was always just something going on inside. I was just focused on content. Yeah, yeah. That was so. I, I ended up having to write a lot of scripts to try to get data so that. Um, Krause could put it in, and here's here's the man admitting to hard coding all that stuff in chat <laughs> for us. Thanks, Todd. Um, <laughs> so we put that stuff into a system so that the designers could you know make changes to it, and then we could we could patch things and push them out without having to to bother code for it. Um, Todd and I, Todd might remember this. Uh, we had to spend a whole bunch of time dealing with uh, trying to look through the logs and find find hackers or find people who are cheating or find broken trade skills, broken quests, all this kind of stuff. So we were we were looking through all the logs trying to trying to do all this kind of stuff. It was part of the the back end, you know, systems scripting and all that kind of stuff that I ended up doing on the team. Uh there was that uh duping, that was it. It was nonstop bugs that we were trying to track down with that. Um, and then there was also a whole process back on Planes of Power with us trying to get data about the players. Um, we didn't have a database with all the player data in it. So I, when, when I wanted to say like, hey, what's the, you know, how strong is the average warrior? How strong is the average, oh, yeah, right. um, you know, uh, rogue? Like what kind of weapons are people using? That's right. We had no one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no idea. Yeah, we don't know what percentage of the player base is, it, 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 what gear level or any of that at the time. So we ended up. So it was just stored. It wasn't in any, back. It wasn't in a database, which I'm not really. I don't remember all the the specific reasons. Something about the load times or how the way they tuned it. But so we had to uh, have Hartsman, I think, at the time, write something that would scan all the all the all the the players data files that were on mm -hmm. disk at, at startup and then dump that into a big data structure that we could then import and then query some data from so i i worked with him a lot on that this was how we got some of the data that i ended up trying to use for itemization in planes of power because when we say like you know how strong are people what's the what's the growth curve of you know weapons and how much more powerful are people supposed to get all these questions that i thought were kind of you know basic for how we should scale the game and how players should get more items and how that you know you get better items you get you fight stronger monsters all that kind of stuff we didn't have any of that data back then so we had to like you said we had to hack together something because it just wasn't we didn't have the tools for it um we just had to work around all the stuff that we, we were dealing with yeah uh, it was a crazy time yeah it was i, I mean uh... And again, it could just be maybe an idealized version of you or what, but I just, I remember you being one of the most pleasantly frustrated people that I've worked with. Like you're very frustrated <laughs> at the fact that things were either implemented the way they were or just completely obtuse or we had none of the data. We had none of the, like nothing was really sort of available when you came in. You're just kind of like, how is this possible? And then you would just <laughs> go about like trying to figure out some way to uh, get the data and I don't know, create a solution, which is admirable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember it just looking back on it. I remember it being surprised that this is the way that video games worked. I had this idealized version of it in my head, I guess, you know, 
being a, a person who has played video games growing up, um, that that somehow everything like the the people who are making these things know exactly what they're doing and how they have all these great tools and they uh, you know understand exactly how all their things work. And so that was my first experience on the other side and seeing how things how the sausage sausage is made, right? And mm. uh, realizing that it's actually a lot of just ad hoc and people are throwing these things together and uh you know they're fighting fighting with each other in the back end and um no people don't know how this thing works and so it just you know doesn't get any love it's just it's a hilarious you know peek behind the curtains to to see what what it's really like when you have this idealized version in your head when you're on the other side of it yeah well you've been doing this for like 20 years now um it, it, have you found that to be more common than not? Um, I'd say yes overall. I, I don't know. I, uh, I feel like the industry's changed somewhat too oh, since for then. Sure. For sure. Right. And uh, from what I've talked to, people who have been around even longer than that, you know, going back making games in the '90s through the '80s, even, um, they say, "Yeah, this is that's what it was always like back then." And you know, like, oh, nowadays, you know, people are actually, you know, hiring writers to, to do the writing and they, you know, have focus groups or their test groups that will, that they'll play the games with and that kind of stuff. And, you know, back then we didn't have any of that. It's just throw your thing together and ship it and hopefully somebody likes it. So I think a lot of that stuff is, is advancing, but there's probably still a lot of companies that just flying by the seat of their pants the whole time, you know? Yeah. I've seen a lot of seats, you know, what was I about to say? Seats, pants flying? Flying, but I've seen a lot of that sort of aviation. Um, uh, and that's not to say anything bad about the companies. It was just, it, it, no. there's, but then I've also had people that have gone to even bigger companies or really successful companies and they've reported back and they're like, dude, it's the same thing. It's just yeah. uh, on a different scale. They just happen to be making a billion dollars. Yeah. It's what I've heard about Dota 2 with Valve or, you know, I heard back, back when I had a friend on the team back, you know, seven or eight years ago. Yeah, like yeah, they're just they're just like people throwing stuff in and hoping it works. I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> it's the same thing there. I've learned it's to pretty... appreciate and love it. Um, I, I love it. And Todd said, "Passion ideas make a game." Yeah. <laughs> um, the oh man, what is, what is it going to go with that? Crap. Anyway, yeah, I was just because I looked up the chat and saw <laughs> saw Absor reference. <laughs> Absor. Uh, Alan Vancouvering. That was Vancouvering. Okay. Yeah. Abashi. Abashi was Gordon. Gordon. Gordon Ren. Yeah. And he was I he did... was kind of beforehand. I don't know. Did he go to yeah. EQ2 or something? I don't think I ever actually worked directly no. with Gordon. Um, I was going to say I just I just logged into EverQuest right before this, right? Because I was going to go and check out my character and have a I have some kind of a staff named after Abashi. It looks like it got nerfed since I played it you know, <laughs> 15 years ago. Yeah. Like, oh, no, it's, it's disappointing. Um, the Abashi Dispel Monk Staff, that's it. Abashi's Rod of Disempowerment, I think. Used to be instant cast. Kibiz says, What's your main, what was your main server? I was on Prexus. I uh, I had to go look it up to find out where my character was, so I could go look and, and see what he still had. I have I had 255 days played on it, or 256 so or so. That was my end my end time of of my uh, my character. What was the last What was the last stuff that you guys rated? Uh, I basically was doing a lot of the development on Planes of Power. And I logged in and played with the guild still once in a while here and there during Planes of Power, but really I was, my attendance was dropping fast because I had a job now. I wasn't just in school and I didn't have nearly as much time to go and do that kind of stuff anymore. Yeah. So probably something in there. I might have, I might have gone with them to Plane of Time once, but I don't think I uh, got much further. The last, the last raid item I had was one of the, Look like the necklace off of the the boss from the Luckland end zone. That was the last thing I could see on my character. Yeah. Praxis. 
Hey, I do remember, by the way. So the quest, the dwarf quest, it was the... Okay, was oh, the, yes, thank you. There was a... Uh, we added a new slot. There was like a charm slot. And we had this system where it could scale based on, your, based on some sort of other stats or other kind of system, right? So we, we had all these kind of low-level charms. Because it was a low-level low, low expansion we were making, we were shipping. But we wanted something for the higher-end players to have. So I made a charm that scaled based on specific events that you'd accomplished. Like if you'd, if you'd beaten Nagafen, if you'd beaten, I don't know, it was like a series of, of, of major events that we could check on your character, like flags that you had. Did right? we have flags before that, or did flags go in specifically for the flagging in pop? Uh, we got flags with the scripting system, that one that Jeff Peterson added. Mm. We got this ability to put flags on characters, and that's what we were using to control the instancing of Planet Time. So we were, we were doing that stuff in the back end, in the background there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the pop charm. And you would talk to the, this little dwarf in the Plane of Knowledge, and he would tell you, he would, you would tell him, it was, if the lore is that you're telling him about all these crazy things you're doing, he's upgrading your charm. That was the that was the one I wrote. I remember. But, but what do you what? know what happened there? Because something like as soon as you started, as soon as you mentioned the dwarf and you started saying it, I this is gonna sound goofy. I know, but I almost got a little teary eyed. And I swear there was something about that damn dwarf that like broke my heart. What was <laughs> do you do you he remember was, that quest? I've gotta look yeah, it up. I, he was just like waxing nostalgic about you with all these all these adventures that you've had in everquest you know the the lore behind it being like you talk you talk to him he's checking your flags and he's like oh look you have the flag for you kill naga fan so i'm going to talk to you about that that was it i mean that was i remember that being the entirety of it and i i was just trying to get something in there for the higher end players to have a charm that was decent because otherwise the the expansion was lower little lower end players or lower level players and they wouldn't have anything so that's that was it that was the whole reason i did it but i remember you liking it what okay so ruling in chat just said you told the dwarf your stories because he couldn't why couldn't he this is this has got to be what's making me emotional right now what was going on with the dwarf uh, was he injured was he stuck i don't remember he was like an old dwarf that like couldn't go oh, off he's and old. Do stuff. And so <gasps> you were you were going and doing adventures and he would he was he was just like enjoying it through you or something like that like yeah. you know living vicariously through your your stories something like that i don't know that was my just trying to come up with something that would make sense for how we're checking all these completely disparate flags on your character and we're going to hide this by you know making it a storytelling uh, you know sharing stories you you're like i i, I just tossed it in there and i'm sitting here i'm like <laughs> i'm getting teary eyed again i don't even know what the hell it was it's like this was like 18 years ago or some shit is that his name Signal? I'm gonna have to look it up. EQ. Dwarf. Quest. Oh, somebody's got them. Somebody's got them. We'll link them. Now, if I read this, if, if I read it in the dialogue, it, it, dialogue isn't what I thought it was, and I'm gonna be I bummed. This, I don't remember this being it. Is this it? I'm looking it up right now. I'm clicking that link. Maybe it wasn't like a fan box. Uh, I think it's all related to, it's all related to, it's just related to the, um, cause we didn't do all the flags back in the day. We only did them. We started with them in planes of power. Yeah. So I'm reading the quest, I'm reading the quest text now, right? Like, thank you for the tales. So-and-so. It's good to imagine these places, even if I may never see them. Why did this, like, I'm not saying it's, like, I'm going to have to reread this. I'm not saying it's <laughs> not living up to my, my memories or anything right now. I'm just scanning it. But I just remember it being, like, something super rad about it. I don't remember. I don't, like, looking at it, I'm reading this. I don't remember. I don't remember this at all. I don't remember writing the specific lines. I'm wondering if this was it. There may have been some other. 
yeah. some other of your creation anyway. broke my heart. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe we don't have all those old emails back in, from back then. Oh I remember I had a, I had a, I had a folder of saved emails from some of the crazy stuff that got sent around. Yeah. Remember like poop is not food and that kind of stuff. Poop is not food. Who wrote that? Frisnick? Rich. Rich. <laughs> he wrote poop is not food because somebody put in a, a food item that was something dung and he was he just oh. wrote an email to the team that was like poop is not food and <laughs> he fixed it. Yeah. I um I I do remember that now. Uh, I'll refrain from names and stuff like that, but I, I remember that period. I remember Frisnick getting upset about the hero meat sandwich. Yep. Um, yeah. There was a, a very big fight about Phoenix eggs, if you recall. Yeah, Phoenix eggs. Yeah. Not making yes. sense. Yep. I remember that fight. I just saved a lot of those emails, uh, but they were, of course, you know, lost, lost the time on the, on the, the servers back yeah, the, the the email server, so I can never read them again. Well, if anybody if anybody out there works at Dropbox, so I apparently I said you know two factor authentication on my Dropbox, and now I can never get back into it again. Um, and so I swear I have my old original Dropbox has got all of this because I was I, I swear I tossed all of that stuff that I probably wasn't supposed to take with me when I left the team or the company into Dropbox and there's yeah it's not, I guess maybe Sony did it um yeah 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 I wish we had them oh um <laughs> Yeah, I recall a couple of those team meetings or team discussions, I guess, about things that we, we could and couldn't put in the game. I recall those. So, I had to fix, I had to fix, same time period, I had to fix an item that was a, it was on like a level 35 NPC. And it was, I think, a castable by anybody stun that was like a three second stun. With a two-second cast time, mm -hmm. yeah. So you could just sit there and stun something infinitely. I had to, I had to fix that one. <laughs> yeah, and, there was some good ones back then. And there was a certain amount of that stuff that like predated you, and then there's a certain amount of that stuff that was also just sort of we were continuing to do it and it had to be caught in real time. And I assume there's probably stuff that continued after that. So, dude, we we are past the top of the hour. I know you said you had an hour. Um totally up to you but uh one thing i'd love to do in the in the future um is get a couple of you together i, I mentioned that before the stream um we, we've done one panel discussion um and it was a lot of fun i'd love to get i especially love to get like uh you and rich and you know ryan and a few others uh hartsman and todd if you're around you know what i mean like just Get some people in and, and see because there's got to be some stuff that once you guys start going, it will, it will get triggered. Yeah, I think probably probably uh, help remember, remember different things that happened. Um, that'd be fun. Just try to find some time that we can all get on. But Yeah, that's the challenge. Fortunately, yeah. most of you are in the same time zones, roughly. It's, I'm the odd man out. So, Yeah. That's fine. We can try to find something like this in the in the mornings, in the morning for us, you know, evening for you. Probably yeah. get to do that. Well, honestly, guys, anytime you guys could get together, I I would do it, even if that meant like waking up <laughs> at three in the morning or something to pull it off. I'd be happy with that. Um, be fun. Yeah. So if you so, got more time, feel free. We can go through some more. We we've, we've only done the first part of your career there, but um, if you've got to go, completely understand. This was kind of a spur of the moment. But I'm super amped you were able to do it. Yeah. Um, oh, it's been fun, man. I uh, was going to say, somebody asked who did the moss-covered twig. And uh, I was going to say, I don't know. That was, that was a little bit before my time. But I do recall running the numbers, and it wasn't, wasn't nearly as good as people thought it was, I think. I can't remember the, the details of it. but It sounds right. Um, that was a, I think it was a Kunark. Or maybe Velius item, Kunark. Kunark. 
And that was, like I said, the time when people would just throw random stuff in and doesn't, doesn't, they didn't, there was no like, how, how strong should a monk weapon be? How strong should a rogue weapon be? It was, it was very ad hoc. And so there wasn't a lot of, of, uh, of work done on tuning for it. Um, and then there was one other question. Oh, somebody asked if I had anything to do with the sleeper story or script. And no, that was, that was before my time. That was Velius. I don't know if you were, you did anything with that. Nope. Um, that was before my time as well. I think I was basically an apprentice to an apprentice in that, in that period. Um, and just kind of fixing little bugs and, um, sitting next to Steve when he was doing like ring war stuff. But That's right. You did some of the ring war stuff. Yeah. Um, my guild did wake up the sleeper on our server though, which I know is, uh, a very controversial thing because back in the day, right, once you wake the sleeper, you stop getting all the loot that they dropped and the loot that they get afterwards wasn't as good. Yeah. 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 I got, I got the robe off of it for the monks, which was great, but less ethical. It was a, a very controversial uh, design back in the day. Yeah. It's still an interesting, it's still an interesting choice. We did, maybe one day we have to walk through that one specifically as a group and kind of figure out whether or not that's the right call. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was us fighting with, uh, fighting with another guild on the server and we knew they were going to get in. So we, we woke it up. It was one of those things where, how do you say that? It's like the design of the game. You can design games that make players, uh, fight or, you know, react to each other in different ways. And, uh, it's uh it's definitely on the players too but the the game design like from coming from a game designer perspective like if you make your game this way it's making people hate each other you probably you know you might want to think about how you're designing your game in this way might not have been the best idea because Maybe. i don't know Maybe. I think it's a big challenge with with, with uh i don't know games like uh, league of legends and, and dota 2 right you, you've got a team game and that's the nature of the game. You're supposed to have a team. You're supposed to be able to support each other, but it leads to very uh, strong emotions on on many people's or on many players' parts, right? Where they're mad because the other person's not pulling their weight or whatever it is, and so um, it's difficult to try to design around those kinds of situations. I guess it is. But, I'd be very curious. I'd love to get more metrics on stuff like that to kind of figure out how much that kind of frustration and hate either churns people or leads to further re retention because what yeah. i it almost feels like that moment if you watch like if you've read the book or watched the howard stern movie where they're going through the numbers and they're saying the average howard stern fan listens for whatever it is 2.5 hours and then they go and which is like unbelievable and then they go the average person that hates howard stern listens for four hours right and it seems like a lot of our uh, tech is driven off of you know, it, it runs off of uh, manufactured uh, outrage and hostility. So maybe, maybe things like that were just ahead of their time. Yeah. Could be. I think, uh, I think the biggest thing I, is that if you're going to make your game that way, if that's the goal, then you should keep that in mind with your design and not have it just be this accidental thing that comes out <laughs> like, oh, we forgot that this is going to make people hate each other, huh? Right. And that's, Back to what I was saying about the point of seeing the other side of game design where they don't always, you don't always know the outcome of, of your decisions, um, but you hope that people would think about that kind of stuff at least so that they yeah. say, yeah, this is going to make people hate each other, but it's going to be a better game for it versus we're completely surprised how this turned out, uh, you know, and, and not really know what to do with it. So That's a very, very fair point. Yeah. John, feel <laughs> free to if, hang out. And answer more questions. Otherwise, we can we can wrap this one up, and uh, then I'll follow up and see if uh, you want to do this again. And maybe we can we can give the folks here a little bit more heads up. Um, now they yeah. know who you are and what sort of questions to bring. Yeah, I uh, I think that sounds like a good idea. Try to find a good time. Maybe we can get it, like you said, a couple of us on here and. Mm. Uh, 
and kind of uh, reminisce and, and uh, answer questions for people who have them. That'd be badass, dude. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for hopping on. And uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to having you back. And if you talk to any of those folks as well, maybe plant the, the bug in their, their ear and I'll talk to some people and see if we can get things going. Um, and if you're not in our discord, I'll get you a link to the discord and you can maybe help me round some people up. Cool. Sounds cool. good. Thanks for having me on, Sean. Absolutely. Thanks, Sean. All right. Bye, dude. Take care.